And this is our monthly ultrasound rounds. I try to I try to aim for kind of a Western Canadian collaboration. And usually this happens every kind of three to six months. Just really depends if we can get all our ducks in a row and try to optimize uh, how many people can attend. So um, we have uh, three different sites presenting today. It'll be Dr. Tom Jellick, who's a uh, eMERGE doc out of uh, Winnipeg, who's a stellar emergency physician and ultrasonographer and TE extraordinaire. Don't kid yourself. You're an excellent physician and, and sonographer. Dr. Jessica Wang, uh, also another uh, intensivist and, uh, and also kind of, I, I think, cardiac trained intensivist as well, on top of uh, additional uh, ultrasound and echo training. And uh, certainly another expert uh, in this field. And, and myself, I'm intensive care doctor at University of Alberta Hospital with an interest in critical care ultrasound and echo. So we have our uh, key principles there. I, for us, I would move the, uh, the video chat box, but my cursor is gone. I'm not clear why, uh, strangely. But uh, we've just had a, a, about five more enter the room. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here. Tom, if you want to take it away from here, I'll just stop my share and you can pick it up from there. Got it. All right. So yeah, as Brian said, my name's Tom um, from Winnipeg. Uh, yeah, so I do emergency medicine and uh, we'll uh, give you a couple of cases here that'll uh, made us go, hmm, that's kind of weird. And uh, one case, I'm actually happy that uh, there's a lot, lot of people in this room that are smarter than me that hopefully I can dissect this uh, first case because... Uh, Couple of people I've shared this with, uh, no one's quite sure what to make of it. So uh, let's dive in. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? We're all good from that end. Perfect. Okay, so case number one, a uh, 67 year old gentleman uh, presented in cardiac arrest, uh, was complaining of chest pain prior to a witness collapse at home. Uh, initial rhythm with uh, EMS was a uh, tachycardia uh, PEA, however, uh, and uh, was uh, had an IGL placed by uh, um, EMS providers. And title CO2 was kind of in the 20s and 30s uh, upon arrival to the ED uh, and was still in PEA. Um, so the first thing, obviously, we did a transthoracic view to kind of get a sense of what was going on and kind of quickly found a pericardial effusion and a, a left-sided pleural effusion, which I thought was a bit odd. Uh, so we proceeded to perform kind of an emergent uh, kind of aspiration of the pericardial fluid. So if you guys can kind of hopefully see my cursor here. Uh, so we're using a linear probe here just because uh, this gentleman was fairly thin, but you can see kind of myocardium in the far field here, this anechoic area here, and our needles kind of coming in uh, from the dot side uh, screen left uh, into the space. Uh, so under dynamic guidance, we're able to pull out uh, about 30 cc's of blood and uh, post-aspiration patient had ROSC. So we're like, all right, this is great. Uh, but it was quite tenuous post-ROSC. Uh, and at this point, we decided to deploy a T to kind of gain some further assessments in the hemodynamic uh, studies. So um, we uh, got our initial four chamber and moved to the uh, mid-esophageal long axis view, a uh, bit of a focus kind of on the uh, left atrium at the near field, uh, our mitral valve and our left ventricle here. Again, uh, contraction, particularly of the uh, kind of posterior inferior walls is a little bit diminished, um, but nothing overly striking here. Uh, we then kind of withdrew to kind of get a sense of what was going on with the aortic valve and the aortic root there, and that looked A-OK. -okay. And the whole kind of idea of chasing down the aorta here was uh, the pericardial fluid and the unilateral pleural effusion. So again, nothing striking that was really jumping out at us at this point of the game. Uh, we did a transgastric view, transgastric short axis, and again, you can really appreciate uh, a really suboptimal cardiac activity, and the whole uh, lateral uh, wall is down. And again, uh, unclear if this was a uh, new uh, or if this was a pre-existing condition when this guy uh, didn't really seek medical care and there wasn't anything in the electronic medical record uh, that we could uh, tease out. And unfortunately in Winnipeg, we have a bit of a disconnect uh, from our ECHO reports where they're not actually pushed to our EMR that we can see in the emergency department. Uh, so again, if he didn't have an ECHO, we, we, were, we are not aware of this. If this is a new finding or old finding. Uh, but from uh, the transgastric view, uh, if you swing your T probe to the patient's left, you're able to get the uh, aorta. And this was kind of what we saw. Um, so kind of just to get our bearings down here, you can see the kind of uh, atelectatic lung with a small uh, pleural effusion on the left side here. And uh, the aorta, that's full of stuff. Um, so at this point, this was kind of pretty far down, right? We're transgastric, we're below the diaphragm and rotated to the left. Um, so we're going to start following that aorta up and figure out what's going on with it. And just to kind of, again, uh, you know, good focus principle, if you've seen an abnormality in one uh, axis, you should confirm it's the real deal in, uh, in an orthogonal plane. 
And so this is just a 90 degree cut through the uh, seam parts. And you can appreciate uh, that that's, that's, that's pretty real. It's not an artifact. Uh, and there's a lot of mobility and indicative that this is probably some type of established thrombus. Um, so as we kind of move through the aorta, we went back to look at the valve one more time. And again, you can appreciate it's tri-leaflet. And I didn't get a clip of it, but it, we withdrew. There wasn't really much to see in the uh, um, proximally ascending aortic root. But this is kind of uh, coming up to the arch. So you can see even the part of the arch and going back to the descending portion are involved here. So this is kind of top of the arch, arch, and then coming back down, de mm -hmm. descending. There's kind of established clots formed uh, the entire way there. If we kind of pause this clip here, this is kind of the part that kind of caught my eyes. I can kind of maybe convince myself that there's maybe a lumen here. And the thought was, does this guy just have a massive dissection um, that uh, causes problems? Um, at this point, this was kind of the working diagnosis. He had trace AR that uh, we could pick up. Um, and then at this point, he deteriorated, uh, went into an asystolic of arrest. We kind of reviewed the case real quick with our cardiac surgeons, like, is there anything you can do? And their thought was with uh, in, an aorta that's nearly entirely occlusive, uh, this, this is kind of a non-survival case. Uh, so the patient uh, was, uh, we kind of terminated efforts at this point. But it was a bit of an interesting case uh, in the sense that uh, I've never encountered a, a thrombus uh, to this degree. Um, when uh, one of my colleagues brought up, you know, could this have just been a prolonged downtime and poor CPR causing that? And, and again, you see thrombus develop within chambers of the heart, but I've never seen uh, that uh, develop within the uh, uh, lumen of the aorta. So I don't know if anyone else has had this experience or seen anything to this degree, but that was kind of a bit of a, uh, an unusual uh, uh, presentation and uh, ultrasound images that kind of threw us a bit for a loop. So, so Tom, this is a case in uh, Edmonton. So those are uh, it's a great case, great set of images. I would say that probably this is not just a lack of like cardiac flow and like you see isolated thrombus just in the descending thoracic aorta up to into the arch because your LV didn't have any smoke in it, right? Like it wasn't just like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like if, you, if it was going to be like low flow state, it would be low flow state in multiple places. And you'd look back in the LV in the LA. And I, I know that you said that there was some stuff uh, you guys were looking in the LA, but that looked more like, you know, um, typical like non-echoic kind of fluid, like blood stuff. And then right. as you go into the arch, like you have parts of the arch, like in the ascending that was normal. And then as soon as you got to the arch and descending, that's when it was abnormal, right? So like, I think what you did find was probably, as you guys said, like a massive thrombus. The thing to kind of like, um, just for the learners on the line, is maybe put color across where you saw that little flap there. Yeah. Because then if there was flow, like, you know, uh, you know, pulsatile flow, red, very like, you know, like uh, back to, yeah, just uh, come back to maybe around, maybe not this image, but maybe the one before it, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, right here, right here. This is the time to put the color because then, the color would tell you, yeah, you still have normal flow in the true lumen, and then the false lumen is all thrombosed off, right? So that would have, like, again, it's a minor point because, you know, again, not a survival situation, probably not fixable, but just from, like, if you wanted to kind of cinch up the thing that is, yeah, it probably was an intramural thrombus that thrombosed off an entire dissection that occurred beforehand, uh, that might be one way to do it, so. Yeah. But great case. I feel like we've seen a lot, we've seen, done a lot of Fair bit of TE and cardiac arrest, and that that, that would not be a, a common finding to have oh. that degree of thrombus develop in the aorta. Yeah, good that the surgeon. Yeah, I've, did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've never I've never seen that before. So yeah, like it threw us for a loop, particularly you know uh, us in the ED that typically don't deal with uh, you know kind of the postoperative uh, um, aortic repairs and whatnot. So yeah, it was, it was definitely an interesting one. Is that what his case was? Was he a post-op repair? Or was this uh, like native kind of like dissection? Yeah, I know this was native dissection. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Interesting. Um, I was going to say those are really cool pictures. Like I've seen a case where it was an unwitnessed arrest and they had like a massive thrombus in the IVC that was sort of mistaken oh, yeah. for oh. kind of large, like, you know, maybe could this have been massive PE? But in the end, we sort of figured out it was actually just because he was unwitnessed arrest probably for maybe 10 minutes. And that was enough time for a clot to form in the venous side. But I sort of would agree with, it seems weird that you didn't sort of see clot anywhere else to just sort of blame it on yeah. low flow. For sure. For sure. Yeah, those are great points. Cool. Um, yeah, any other questions about that one? Or we'll dive into the second case. Uh, so the second case, uh, uh, it's a seven-year-old female that's been sitting in our department for several hours. Uh, she came in essentially acutely confused, tachycardic, and hypotensive. Um, her initial vitals... Uh, when we took over her care, she had a heart rate of 110, 
a blood pressure of 83 on 59, uh, was oxygenating okay, 96% on three liters. And at this point, she received about four liters of crystalloid uh, for persistent hypotension. Um, the background history on her is she was recently diagnosed uh, through her primary care physician uh, with the UTI, uh, was treated with the macrobid, and uh, was kind of persistently febrile at home, and didn't really have any other medical history or any uh, medications that she was on. Uh, so we uh, had our uh, sauna squad, as we like to call them, Oops, sorry. And so the question was, what's going on and why is she uh, so, um, so hemodynamically unstable? The other interesting thing is uh, one of uh, my astute PGY1s picked up uh, that she had a rip-roaring uh, systolic murmur. So this is one thing to me that's, uh, you know, the beauty of this case that we'll kind of touch, touch base on in a bit, how uh, our physical exam and our ultrasound findings are kind of augment each other. Um, so yeah, we went to go put the probe on and kind of see what was driving this murmur. Did she have endocarditis? You know, is the classic Winnipeg 70-year-old doing IV drugs? Like, who knows? <laughs> so... Uh, this was kind of our initial views of the parasitic lung. We did deal with a bit of body habitus issues, but this was kind of the best we can get. And kind of uh, the one thing that caught our eye was uh, how hypertrophic um, the septum was there. Um, and we kind of thought that the LV at end was a bit underfilled despite getting that much volume. And when we put some color flow on, and there was a lot of uh, kind of that mosaic pattern of our Doppler flow, uh, could have optimized our scale a bit here uh, in retrospect, but uh, yeah, a lot of mosaic pattern here indicating that there's some turbulent flow going on uh, to clue us in. Uh, we then tried to M mode this to see what exactly was going on and if there was signs of kind of a dynamic LVOT obstruction. So on the screen left is kind of the image we got from our patient. Um, and again, it's kind of the M mode spike down. Uh, this is what a normal M mode spike should look like. So there's your E A wave pattern of the mitral valve um, uh, during as it opens in the atrial kick. And you can see in our image, particularly here where the valve opens, there's nearly complete, or sorry, when the valve closes, uh, there's a lot of kind of movement of the uh, interventricular septum towards, uh, towards the uh, mitral valve apparatus. So indicating that there's probably a, a obstructive uh, a flow going on here. Uh, we checked out uh, RV systolic function, and that looked like that was preserved with a TAPSI that measured uh, uh, about, uh, I think, 30 millimeters. Uh, and in an apical five chamber, again, we just wanted to corroborate that what we were sealing, sealing was real. And again, there was that colorful mosaic jet uh, indicative of uh, pretty turbulent flow. Um, the other, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The other thing that uh, we also clued into is our posterior mitral valve leaflet just looked very odd and thickened. And again, in, in this, you know, in a patient of this age, you know, is it, uh, you know, calcification? Although we don't see that tap typical uh, shadowing of a calcified valve, that kind of caught our eye as, as another abnormality. Um, we deployed some Doppler jet of the LVOT uh, uh, velocities, and again, uh, this is grossly abnormal, so measured about 617 centimeters per second, and I think reference, if I remember correctly, range should be between 80 to 100. Um, so again, very high patterns and indicative of, uh, of uh, high flow. And again, another feature of SAM uh, that you can try to elicit is this uh, um, uh, kind of dagger pattern uh, of the LVT obstruction, which we weren't able to elicit, although you can kind of make out a bit of this hyperchoic or uh, uh, brighter structure that's kind of dagger-like. The whole idea behind it um, is that the velocity of the outflow is, is late peaking and why you get that kind of dagger-shaped appearance that's depicted on the screen right. Uh, so that's kind of typically what you want to look for. So if you get them to kind of uh, Valsalva, you'll kind of elicit this and uh, kind of induce it and kind of hopefully you can pick that up. So at this point, our overall findings, again, we had uh, LV hypertrophy, a bit of an underfilled LV cavity size, or RV was normal function. Uh, we thought the initial uh, valves, uh, or the mitral valve, the posterior leaflet was calcified, just uh, likely due to age. And again, we had a bit of uh, MR as well, and uh, LVOT obstruction, as uh, Brian alluded to, um, that was causing her problems. So... Um, for our echo diagnosis, we need kind of one of the following uh, unexplained LV hypertrophy uh, and then septal posterior wall thickness uh, in the ratios that you see them there. Now, I got super excited by this case, and we obviously consulted our uh, cardiology group to come help us out and kind of show them this images. And they're like, yeah, that's cool. They're like, but, you know, anyone who has uh, LVH uh, and when they're in shock states, they're probably going to have some function of uh, SAM. And I was like, ah, no way to burst my bubble, guys. <laughs> so... Uh, just a little background here, but the whole motion of uh, the whole idea of SAM is uh, again, you get, due to this turbulent flow in the uh, uh, hypertrophic septum, uh, you get a venturi effect of the uh, mitral valve apparatus that essentially kind of 
gets sucked and pulled into the uh, LVOT and causes obstruction. So um, again, a couple of ways you can evaluate this. Uh, you can look for, again, your mitral valve recursion jet, which should be usually direct infrared laterally. Uh, you can, uh, again, M mode it as we did it to try to can catch the uh, anterior leaflet when it's coming into contact with the septum. Um, in your apical views, you can try to determine that LVOT gradient, uh, looking for high uh, pressure gradients, and again, that color mosaic pattern. And again, if you're sad with spectral Doppler, uh, to elicit the uh, dagger shape, if, if you can uh, pick that up. Um, so again, for us uh, in the ED, this kind of changed her management. We, uh, we were kind of humming and hawing, you know, do we give her more volume or hold off? And at this point, we kind of said, well, let's, let's give her a bit more volume. Uh, and uh, put her on a uh, low dose uh, as well infusion, and kind of the two were able to wean her norepi requirements off pretty quickly. Uh, so eventually ended up getting admitted to the critical care unit uh, uh, at our hospital here. Um, and then a couple other principles is again, uh, increase the afterload is another uh, key thing. So you can uh, potentially use something like a pure alpha squeeze like fennel uh, to uh, hopefully not induce tachycardia, but uh, uh, get a bit of afterload that'll stent open the LVOT. So yeah, this was a cool case. Uh, again, for me, it's it's an interesting one. Uh, you know, we had the PGY1 who picked up a rip roaring murmur, uh, and it was great to kind of corroborate with ultrasound and kind of put together why this patient was uh, in persistent shock, uh, right? And it always kind of gets in, in where, you know, full uh, disclosure, we're notoriously bad for chalking up urosepsis to in old folks, which uh, which is not great for their care. But this uh, this patient, I think, uh, uh, you know, once we kind of sorted things out, which, uh, was able to uh, probably get guided therapy. Um, so yeah, that is all I have from Winnipeg. Uh, so yeah. Oh, that's a great case. You know, I think people um, often think that dynamic obstruction is the only phenomenon that occurs in uh, HOCAM or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy but it's clearly not. And uh, it certainly can happen in LVH, but you know, it can happen in a lot of patients with enough, uh, with a, enough drop in preload, enough contractility, you know, enough afterload, it's very easy to obstruct the outflow track. And so, it's, it's interesting in a quick lit review, it was, it was like some, up to 30% of patients admitted to ICUs have a, a dynamic LVOT obstruction, which is crazy. Like that, yeah, that it, seems ridiculously high. And again, I don't know in, in your guys' experience, if you're catching it at that rate, but I feel like you have to look for it's a problem. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, it, there's a lot of cases that we find that it's like, oh, uh, you know, did you guys know that there was this problem? I, I don't think, I think 30% probably is a big overestimate, but the generous. I, I think there are a lot of cases that are there that are missed because honestly, it is a challenging diagnosis to make. And it, it kind of just occurs, in, you know, if they're in refractory shock. And unfortunately, refractory shock is like the, you know, most common diagnosis in ICU. So, <laughs> It's uh, it's it's kind of a, a signal versus noise uh, problem, I think. The other issue is because a lot of patients who are hypotensive, they'll get two to six liters anyways, right? So that you've taken away that echo finding, and they just have to right? Yeah, but certainly, like I always find that I, I find it when the when the diagnosis and the shock are kind of like out of keeping, like asymmetric, like the pneumonia isn't that bad, but they're in severe shock or. You know, like it's not just the 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 ED, the source of the sepsis is just isn't isn't that impressive, um, but their shock seemingly is, um, and I think that's kind of one of the big red flags they talk about in most textbooks. It's just kind of the the severity out of keeping with the diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. And for me, and, and this was like a petite lady, but like you know, when you're starting to get a replacing their entire circulatory volume once in a short time frame, and their blood pressure is still in the boots. Uh, you got to start yes. thinking about the uh, other causes. So, for sure, definitely, yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot, Tom. That was great. Uh, um, any other questions from anybody in the audience? Hey, let's get Dr. Wang uh, on the mic. You ready, Dr. Wang? All right. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh... All right. Hi. Uh, so for those of you don't, who don't know me, uh, I'm Jessica Wang. I'm an intensivist in Calgary. I uh, work at the uh, CVICU at the Foothills as well as the Rocky View and I'm the uh, CVICU uh, site education lead. Uh, and just by kind of a, a way of uh, introduction, I, I did my critical care ultrasound training in Australia uh, with an extra echocardiography fellowship here in Calgary with a cardiologist. So uh, I'm really pleased to be, to be here and thank you for the opportunity to speak. And uh, the case I have today is actually not from the CVICU or the Rock View. It's uh, I was scheduled to 
do some teaching with the ICU fellows uh, to show them the power of critical care ultrasound. Uh, so this is kind of what we, we got out of it. Um, so for our uh, session, we decided to, you know, try and find some critical care patients to practice our skills on, to practice integrating some information. So uh, on the morning we met, we headed up to the unit to troll around for some patients. And um, we uh, head to the general ICU and we find one of the attendings who says, great, uh, I've got a case for you. I've got someone who's on one of Blebo. What's the IVC size? Um, so I can't see anybody's faces here, but uh, you might have the same expression on your face that I had on mine, but I uh, kind of withheld judgment at <laughs> this time. And uh, okay, let's, let's hear some more information. So here's the case. Uh, this is a 73-year-old man. Um, he's known for Addison's disease, so he's on chronic steroids. Uh, also AFib and a previous PE and DVT within the last year or so. Uh, so he's chronically on dibigatran. He does have, have some cardiovascular risk factors, but actually had an angiogram within the last year or so that was normal. And uh, probably of note, uh, he does have a significant surgical history in that he had a Hartman's about four years ago for a perforated sigmoid. Uh, it was complicated by a wound infection that needed a vac, so kind of not the most uh, normal abdomen. And a, a couple of risk factors here for, for shock, shocks of various etiologies. So his story begins about uh, 12 hours prior to ICU admission. Um, so the night prior had sudden onset of left flank and abdominal pain, goes to the eMERGE, gets a CT scan, which was suggested of uh, perforation. So the surgeons take him to the OR in the middle of the night uh, and find a perforated descending colon, feculent peritonitis, and just a really difficult surgery, loads of adhesions. Uh, they couldn't really fully run the small bowel. They had to take down his previous end colostomy. They resected the descending colon. They washed him out and they said hemostasis was good. And this was despite him actually uh, taking his dabigatran uh, the morning uh, before this happened. He's not well though, so uh, not unsurprisingly goes to the ICU with an open abdomen. And here's his flow sheet from the time he was admitted. You can see comes to us at 5.30 in the morning and he's not in good shape. He's on high dose pressors and he gets uh, fluid resuscitated over the next few hours, five liters of crystalloid and that's on top of kind of six liters plus um, at the time of admission. And we kind of come to the bedside around nine o'clock or so. Um, and he's not in good shape. He's modeled to the knees. Uh, overnight, the team did uh, POCUS. They, they called him moderate LV dysfunction, sort of despite that for what it's worth. His central venous sat was 70% and his lactate was kind of slowly creeping up to three. Um, really had a, had a hard time of seeing the IVC, which is sort of why the request came to us. So I think from a teaching perspective, we decided to, to do it all. And I think that's, uh, that's what you do. Uh, so uh, here are our, our pictures. So to start off, these are the, the best pictures that we could get of the heart as uh, not great. Uh, we have uh, something pretending to be a peristernal and a, a subcostal here. And, you know, truthfully, I'd probably say these are non-diagnostic and my my favorite phrase for this is the the impression of adequate heart function uh so you can sort of get the sense there's there's movement there there's there's stuff that's contracting and i probably would say if i had to put my money on it i'd say you know the the heart is probably not the reason why he's on one of lipo um so even though it's not the best picture i think that was the my interpretation anyways uh, to have a quick look at his lungs here, um, on the right side, we've got some B lines, on the left side, more of an A profile. We certainly see lungs sliding on both sides. So at least kind of on first blush, not quite sure how to interpret the right side of findings just yet, but uh, no major shock pathology hiding in the lungs so far. Uh, as promised, uh, we look for the IVC, and so the, the first picture that you see here is our attempt to, to find it from the subcostal view, and really just not great, um, and I think not usable. Uh, so then 
uh, we decide to bail out and use our rescue IVC view to, to try and find it. And just uh, not sure how kind of familiar everyone is uh, for this view, but just to, to demonstrate, I find uh, this is a really handy view to find the IVC when you're having trouble um, to come on to uh, the right side, like usually mid axillary line or so. And you're, you're looking for the vessels here that are gonna be in long axis IVC and aorta. Um, so often a really handy view to use if you're struggling with other things. So just to come back, um, this is our attempt at it. Uh, I was initially you know, wondering if this vessel up here, but I thought it had a little bit too much connective tissue to be IVC. And I thought maybe something down here was the aorta. So our best guess was IVC here and our measurement would suggest that it's actually on the small side. All right, so moving on, uh, we're gonna look at the costophrenic angles. So you start on the right, and again, uh, not great images. We sort of get the, the hint of maybe some pleural fluid there, but what looks like aerated lung uh, also coming into view. So our guess is probably not a massive pleural effusion. Uh, sort of wonder, could there be a little bit of a hypoechoic area underneath the diaphragm? Not sure. And what we really couldn't show off was that um, hepatorenal interface um, so not, not a great picture for really excluding free fluid. Then we move on to the left. And here's where we start to think a little bit. So this is the picture we get. We sort of see something kidney looking uh, down at the bottom of the screen. We're sort of missing, we don't, see our, we don't see our friend the spleen anywhere in sight. We just see all this stuff. Um, you know, it has an echo texture that kind of looks like tissue, maybe a fascial plane. Hard to really know what we're looking at. Um, and then just to kind of go off on a, a brief tangent here. Um, so I'll say that I uh, probably was totally biased by a previous case. So to jump out of this case for a minute um, and go back to a case that I came across with um, in my fellowship training. So this is a, a lady, elderly lady who had a lap coli and was also in shock and I did this scan. And at the time as a, as a trainee, I didn't have enough sort of knowledge to really know what I was looking at. All I sort of got from uh, looking at this image was that there was free fluid in the abdomen. And I you know, managed to persuade the surgeons to, to take her back on this. And actually what they found was uh, she had a splenic laceration as well as a liver laceration. And that's sort of why that you know, here clearly the spleen is ab very abnormal, um, but I felt quite foolish actually because I really only noticed this when I went back to this case and sort of submitted it for as a case review for as part of my like um, ultrasound diploma. So I always like thought a lot about this case in terms of never missing you know spleen pathology again. So this is sort of very biased uh, way of uh, how I how I sort of thought about this case. So to to kind of come back again, you know, wondering what all this stuff is. Uh, one of the ICU fellows decides to pull up the CT scan that he had uh, prior to going to surgery. And then, you know, you kind of, on looking at it, you see that the kidneys are, you know, kind of shriveled up and his spleen's all the way up here. And there's all this space that sort of exists between the um, kidney and the spleen. So am I really just looking at just normal abdominal stuff? Um, maybe. Uh, so regardless, uh, keep looking around uh, and we're uh, looking for the spleen. Uh, so we, we come up towards the head and this is what we see. We see something that looks like diaphragm. We see something that looks like spleen right underneath it. And then as we're attempting to, to fan around, we see this kind of weird hypoechoic area that kind of comes right across what we think is maybe the middle of the spleen. The, to kind of show you a, a less nauseating uh, picture of that. Um, so here's what we see. Um, so it's odd, right? Um, we try and throw on some color because we're thinking, you know, could this be a vessel in the spleen? And I'll say maybe in retrospect, I should have uh, adjusted the scale and I didn't really find it that helpful. And I, you know, wasn't really sure what sort of vessel we would exist that would be there and look like that. Um, so really unsure. So maybe I thought I'd 
pause for a moment and see if anyone else has thoughts about this picture. I'm sitting beside a, a general surgeon intensivist, and I, I'm just thinking, what is what, what is Dr. Winter thinking? <laughs> well, first of all, never believe in a surgeon, especially when they say everything was dry at the end of the tape. I think that, especially in light of the difficult surgery, the extensive lysis of adhesions and with intending colon, how do you get it on splint flexure? Those are all red flags. Um, so, Jessica, I'm a bit of a newbie with ultrasound, and thank goodness Dr. Buchanan has been mentoring me as of late, but I can't comment on what that structure is in the middle, but I'm, a, I'm concerned about the surrounding structures around what appears to be the spleen, and certainly hematoma would be, and bleeding would be a concern yeah. of mine. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. It makes me feel better that uh, this was just as puzzling to other people <laughs> as it was to me. Um, so yeah, you know, regardless of, um, you know, not necessarily knowing what, what it was I was looking at, um, you know, trying to put this together and, and put this all in context. Um, so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, here's kind of how I thought about this case is that we have a man who's on high dose pressors, he's shut down. You, know, you think about his shock that it doesn't look like his heart's responsible and doesn't look like there's anything major in the lungs. He's got a small IVC despite, you know, at least 11 liters of fluid resuscitation. And you've got something suspicious in the abdomen, not quite sure how to interpret it yet. Um, and he's got a major risk factor for bleeding. So I think, I don't want to step back and look at the entirety of the situation. Um, my you know, question to the uh, attending intensivist who's looking after this patient was, is this man bleeding? To which I kind of got this look that said, well, you know, the back dressing doesn't look that fresh and here are the coags and, you know, his hemoglobin's still over 100. And then, you know, like almost as if someone had heard our conversation a new lab result appeared, and uh, oh, here was this <laughs> here was this hemoglobin, um, uh, which had <laughs> <laughs> dropped quite significantly. So I think by that time, so you know, we had enough information. The the team kind of sprang into action. They ordered up a massive transfusion pack. They ordered up the uh, idaricizumab, the Praxbind, um, and we, you know, sort of that was the end of our teaching session so we we kind of left the bedside but you know sort of my last comment to the team was you, you have bleeding he needs to go back um yeah. uh which I sort of left them with that piece of information um and decided to see what they would do with it so what do they do with that information well they asked for they asked for an ultrasound um so they requested a formal ultrasound um and here are their pictures for some comparison and I'll say that, oh. sorry. Oh, I was going to say like, uh, yeah, I just like my heart's pounding here as to why this picture is <laughs> on the operating room. <laughs> yeah. So um, I get it. Yeah. So they get some nicer pictures. Um, and I think it becomes a little bit more clear now that what we're actually looking at. So I'll say that here's what I thought I was looking at um, over here. I thought this all thing was the, the spleen. We had something in the middle. But actually, when you look at their pictures, I think it's a little more clear that it's actually this small thing here was the spleen. And now we have kind of what's blood and clot that's surrounding it. So probably the entire time, um, you know, this tiny thing was actually the spleen. And what was around it was actually hematoma and, and blood. And as well, the report came back as uh, reporting a perisplenic hematoma. And they, they thought suspicious for acute hemorrhage from, from the spleen. Um, so empowered with this information, uh, the team gets to persuade the surgeons to take him back. And maybe I'm sort of reading a little bit too much into this, but you sort of maybe sense a little bit of skepticism in the uh, surgeon's kind of operative uh, first line. Um, but nevertheless, they took him. And as soon as they uh, took off the vac, a large amount of blood immediately encountered. Uh, PGY said, PGY3 said it was massive hair, hemoperitoneum, so a lot of blood. Um, the liver and spleen were actually fine, um, and it was bleeding at the staple line of the colon, which uh, they then fixed up. The bleeding stopped. And, you know, I thought this was this is a great 
I think, case for the ICU fellows to see just in terms of demonstrating, I think, the power of the ultrasound. But somewhat sadly, um, I think it might have been too late. Um, you know, the, the patient couldn't be stabilized even after a surgery, developed multi-organ failure, was kind of frail even before coming to ICU. So eventually just decided to palliate within the kind of next 24 hours. But just to kind of, you know, and I think about this a lot too, you know, here was his uh, flow sheet, here was us. Um, you know, this was a weekday. Um, their access to ultrasound, I thought was actually pretty good. They came with within an hour, which I thought was not bad. Um, you know, there were still some delays in him going to the OR. And I sort of recognize that, yeah, you, you kind of need to mobilize uh, your team and whatnot. But you know, by the time he goes back to the OR, he's had a solid just six hours of bleeding. Um, so I, I, you know, certainly wonder if uh, we could have changed things had he gone back earlier. And uh, I'm sure we all run into this problem in terms of how do you get how do you get buy-in or convince or you know was it was part of the problem you know maybe selling it as a, a you know bleeding from the spleen we should have just sort of stuck with bleeding in, intra-abdominally and you know was that some of the uh, resistance in terms of trying to convince people to to take them back but yeah I'll leave it at that. That was an amazing case, Jessica. A very unfortunate, uh, obviously, uh, you know, un unfortunate outcome, uh, terror outcome. But uh, wow, there's so much to unpack there. I feel like my my colleague beside me, Dr. Witter. Do, do you want to make some? <laughs> do you want to make some comments, Dr. Witter? Well, I just for the the resident learners in the room again, never look at your hemoglobin. Look at your data deficit, right? So you know, when you get a lot closer and you can also have a good active marker of resuscitation in most of the point. I think from a surgical perspective, um, you know, you gotta always check your colleagues and there's no such thing. And never one complication, post off day zero or one is always gonna be bleeding. Bleeding, bleeding, bleeding until proven otherwise. And I think uh, that ultrasound was concerning. And I think it's been very I mean, if I had a nickel for every time I found a dramatic finding when I was teaching teaching um, you know learners, uh, I would have a pretty big jar of coins because um, I I have found a lot of very weird stuff that unfortunately actually is is kind of leads the diagnosis rather than follows it, which is kind of interesting. But um, yeah, it just speaks to sometimes the the ambiguity of working in the in the critical care environment with kind of multi system complex post op transplant patients who can just have any manner of problem in the perioperative setting. And I think just one other thing to highlight, a super great case of like, it's not that slam dunk, you know, uh, spleen floating in blood, it's all clot. Uh, yeah. And just recognizing that like, this does not look like the other, you know, 100 people I've scanned. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great pick, great pickup. Excellent. Okay, just for just cognizant of time here, I will uh, I will start as well, just so we can kind of round this out. And then, if there's any questions left at the end, then uh, we can kind of go from there. So both those cases are actually a fantastic lead up to this uh, short talk on managing unexpected findings, and um, this is something that kind of happens all the time, and it's kind of hard to understand and unpack when you find these things what to do with them. Um, there's this quote, which uh, I thought really uh, encapsulated um, kind of discussion today, but also was stolen from his paper, which was stolen from Louis Pasteur uh, on kind of the same topic. But, you know, I think this this whole round today has kind of revisited this concept of unexpected findings and, and what to do with them and, and how to triage them. And so I'm going to talk briefly about the idea of triaging behaviors. So Often discussion around focus turns to incidental findings, things that are indeterminate, benign, or potentially concerning. I'm just going to move this. Sorry, the okay. Um, but there's also findings that are related to the chief complaint, but not considered as part of the pretest evaluation. Either they're not in the differential, they're not considered, which is which kind of leaves us with the idea, you know, historically it was, you know, you can't make a diagnosis that you've not thought of. But, you know, sometimes with ultrasound, that's not true. You can make a diagnosis you haven't thought of, which is kind of an interesting idea. 
Um, so if you look at unexpected findings, obviously there's this judgment and perhaps you think, oh, it's benign, incidental, like very common, the, the hemangioma you see at an ultrasound course, for example. There's also the unrelated serious incidental, which either can be urgent or needs follow-up, or the kind of related serious quasi-incidental, which I say it's not really incidental because it actually is related to the initial diagnosis. It just wasn't really considered at the, at the start. Um, so I think sometimes it's hard to figure out which of these, uh, the finding you have is kind of related to. So I want to go through a case here. Um, this is a 32 year old female with ARDS and cirrhosis. She's very sick. Um, she's got a very, very bad looking chest X-ray. She's, uh, she's not digressing. She's actually, um, she's deteriorating. Uh, I'm not sure what happened there. With expected edema. She's got little urine output, about 20, 30 an hour, and she's got positive flu balance despite being on ADBID of Lasix. So she was started on a Lasix uh, uh, infusion uh, per hour, around five to eight milligrams an hour, and really little improvement. And she's just, you know, her FO2 is high, her compliance is low. And so the ultrasound team here in our IC was asked to take a look at the belly um, to look to see if the ascites, you know, she's given that she's a cirrhotic, whether or not she could be tapped, if that's contributing to some of her compliance issues. Um, so this is the first image. So I was with the, the team here and um, we're taking a look and you know we recognize that she's probably got a bit of an ileus, um, which makes people very nervous about doing a para because obviously the gut's pretty distended. And so we could see that there was a a tiny bit of fluid there. This is truly right upper quadrant. Obviously, there's probably some, probably that small bowel there. Um, and there's some material in there that's kind of floating on by. And there's a tiny pocket of free fluid. But again, tiny pocket with lots of guts. Again, more guts, more, more, uh, you know, material in the guts. A uh, little more like fluid there. But, you know, frankly, I would almost never tap her upper quadrant for fear of causing uh, major problems. Now we come across this. This is right beside the bowel. I saw a flash of it right there, this kind of circular structure. Okay, and we get a glimpse of it as I kind of sweep on by. Okay, and I think, hmm, that's strange. Don't really know what that is. Okay, so I keep looking around, trying to figure out what this thing is. I just look at the gross distance, see how much how much actual distance there was between the this structure and the abdominal wall. But I was certainly in no uh, interest in tapping this thing, the belly that is, not this circular thing. <laughs> I thought, well, I should probably figure out what this is because it it kind of it keeps hogging up the view of everything else. So I kind of slide the probe down. Is there initial feelings as to what this structure could be? Feel free to yell it out or put in the chat box. Okay, I hear vascular, anything else? Renal cyst. Renal cyst. Okay, well, I, I started hunting. So I, I kind of moved over. I went down near the pelvis, said, hmm, what is, what is that? Uh, and it's got some, got some stuff in it. I'm hearing maybe bladder. Yeah, so I go down and I'm looking around some more. Okay, and then I go down further. Oh, there it is. There is the Foley balloon. Yep, it's a giant bladder, like ginormous, like two to three liters ginormous. Now keep in mind, on a Lasix infusion with poor urine output, 20 to 30 an hour. Okay, so, you know, this, uh, you know, and this is just a transverse scan um, over the pelvic brim, seeing that there actually is a fully balloon there. I looked at both kidneys, there actually was no dramatic hydro, um, Maybe there was a tiny bit of hydroureter, but you know, be very mild. 
So this was an interesting case. I mean, the pocket, I mean, the, the reason was, you know, could we bring ascites and was it affecting compliance? And obviously, I don't think that was the key issue. There was a CT showing that there was like moderate ascites. CT can overcall that. Um, certainly, there was no area to tap. But I think the biggest thing was that there was this obstructed bladder, um, despite having a Foley in place. And so I don't think this was the primary problem driving respiratory failure, but it certainly did not help and complicates its management. And, you know, I think the main reason why I want to bring this up is because, you know, um, it's always these kind of unusual findings where you say, hmm, what is that? And can I explain it? And if I can't explain it, I got to find a way to figure out what it is. So, um, you know, I think sometimes you got to prepare to find the unexpected at times. And, you know, you can explore within your scope and certainly triage in order of comprehensive ultrasound. But it, you know, unfortunately, it kind of really depends on that judgment piece. If your patient's really sick and you're thinking this this might be part of the puzzle, then obviously, you know, as we saw from Dr. Wang earlier, you know, you really need to kind of direct things to be more urgent, right? Whereas, I mean, this case, certainly, I think it was urgent to, to actually um, to actually decompress her urinary tract. Um, certainly, was urgent. So, I think we need to make sure we do keep these things under consideration when these patients are very sick. But I will say that you got to be really careful and straying from your domain of expertise. And that's where ultrasound gets gets kind of much more murky, okay, is when you're, especially on the liver and the spleen, it gets very challenging to understand what you're looking at and is it contributing to the patient's primary illness. And th this phenomenon happens, right? Like the, the horse driving the cart, right? So point of your ultrasound driving the diagnosis, not the pretest, not the, the history, and you have to kind of go back and say, wait, did we just like not consider this? This was just like never considered. And now we find this thing and we have to kind of revisit history. Um, so, you know, I would say that at times it's it's probably worst case scenario that ultrasound has to make the diagnosis. Probably best case is that history makes it. But I will say that in complex, critically ill patients, it's sometimes the history uh, and the physical exam just don't direct you to where you need to go. I mean, certainly I've seen just any number of patients who are critically ill, who the ultrasound reveals everything. And unfortunately, the history and the exam and even imaging didn't show enough. Um, so why was the Foley working because of all the shmutz that was in the acid? I think it was the shmutz. I think it was occluded, but it was interesting. It was letting some urine through. And uh, it's not the first patient I've seen. You know, this patient didn't have kidney failure. But it's not the first patient I've seen with an occluded Foley, renal, like new AKI, new acute kidney injury, and an occluded Foley. They flush it in the middle. Uh, no, they have to replace it entirely. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, I think that's just the, unfortunately, the, the nurse said to me after, oh, it's really strange. Every time we bladder scan, it just says, it just says can't, can't read. Because often the problem is with the CITES, it outlines a pelvic brim, gives this kind of pseudo-bladder appearance, um, which can be difficult to, dis to distinguish from a, a natural bladder. So at the point of care, you do have to give yourself time and space to, to problem solve. And, you know, there is a benefit and a risk of being the practitioner making a decision. You know, the radiologist will tell you that there's a huge benefit to being, uh, to being a radiologist kind of separate from clinical care. They get to look, look at things objectively. However, you will also hear them say, you need to provide more history. <laughs> so I, I think there's a bit of a, you know, two sides of that coin going on. But if ever in doubt, seek further expertise, okay? Um, and I, I would say that if you're around a patient in particular, just be very aware of the sensitivity. You know, th there is a benefit for technologists who examination with ultrasound and being and, and saying, oh, you know what? I can't tell you the findings. Wait to the radiologist because of problems like this. Okay. This patient that I scanned, 76 year old female, with middle of urosepsis and neuropleural effusions. And while examining her with a group, showing them how to, how to look at pleural effusions, we discovered that her liver was in fact packed full of metastases uh, to no one's uh, knowledge. Um, so these events do happen and they're kind of like these kind of nail biting events, like, oh my God, oh, this is bad. And kind of just got to keep moving on and say, you know what, we're going to order, we're going to talk to some of our colleagues and get some more imaging. Um, but I also, at the same time, wouldn't jump to conclusions that it is this or it's that, especially if it's not in your domain of expertise, just defer, you know, very much. I'm not sure 
I'm not sure what I'm looking at. We'll need to get some more imaging. Because I guarantee this happened to all of you with ultrasound. At some point, you're going to pick up some problem or liver mets, which honestly can go missed very easily. Sake of time, we'll keep going on here. 75 year old male with agitation admitted to psychiatry, limited history, he's visiting from BC. There's really no record. He develops mild hypoxia, two to five liters, confused overnight. GM's consulted for fever, hypoxia, confusion. And uh, they called us because um, they just weren't sure what was going on. Also, they felt like he probably needed a lumbar puncture. And um, I got a call from the consultant on GIM because they were, you know, concerned about him. Plus, they uh, really wanted him to get an LP and they couldn't do it because they were just inundated. Which uh, I was on a medical emergency team. So I said, whatever, fine, I'll go see him. Um, but, you know, I tried to shift, I, I, I tried to shift into internist mode, which is like, you know, make sure you go back and take a history. That way I, I wasn't too much kind of the ICU and, you know, going there to just do the procedure. So I bought up the ultrasound machine because I, I don't know, I, I just felt like, you know, the diagnosis of meningitis was just one of those, like, you know, we have to rule it out, but not most likely. And I was like, I should probably find out what the diagnosis is. And so I bought the ultrasound probably long thinking maybe the x-ray is understating it. The x-ray had like, you know, linear atelectasis and all, you know, uh, x-ray has limited sensitivity. So, you know, his, his, uh, Ultrasound for the chest wasn't that impressive. His his left left base had maybe some like mild consolidation, but very very superficial, um, and minimal like minimal B lines, no actual dense consolidation. But then on the right side, you know, I just came across this image here, and you know, I just stop for a moment. So let you guys take a look at that. Okay, so what next? And, um, you know, just for a kind of a general poll, what does everybody here think we should do with this? This is kind of a uh, incidental finding. Okay, it's, uh, I, you know, I, I am no expert in liver lesions because it's a complicated science and the radiologist is much better than we are. But, uh, you know, maybe by a show of, here, hands, but by a show of thumbs online, who wants to ignore? I think it's probably been probably benign. Okay, who wants to leave note on the chart for comprehensive imaging? Okay, you got one one vote or maybe two. Some reluctant people maybe waiting till it's all cards on the table. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to discuss with the radiology colleague? Okay, you got one vote here. And who wants to refer for urgent imaging? Well, Got three. His heart rate's about 110. His blood pressure is like 110 on 70. He's 94% on three liters. Yeah, he's a bit confused too. Like it's truly like that was the story. Like he wasn't that sick, but he was febrile and tachycardic. Okay, so I think I got mostly refer for ur urgent imaging. Now, I personally was like, well, you know, I may as well figure out, uh, get some more images here. At least if I have some more fodder, then I can maybe get things expedited. Okay, so here I go. I'm thinking, well, wait, that's clearly not the kidney because the kidney is clearly seen. Right? And it's not, it's not the only thing that's there, right? Like, there's some other stuff there. And what can you guys comment on that circular thing in the center of the screen? What, looks complex, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it looks big too. And it looks like it's not only one of them either. It looks like maybe there's multiple. And it's right in the liver parenchyma. And it's very, very big. Okay, so this is adjusted 12 centimeters. This thing is about uh, is about 10 centimeters by eight centimeters by eight centimeters. Like it's it's ginormous. Here we go again. There's obviously some contents in there that's kind of floating around. And I threw some Doppler on it, although I think I'm getting actual mixed signals here. Uh, I don't think this is actually from the from the um, mass itself. So what did I do? I 
texted a photo, uh, a clip of this by Connect Care to my colleague, Chris Wong, in radiology, and said, hey, I'm up on psychiatry for a patient with query meningitis versus pneumonia with this liver mass. Would really love to sketch your opinion on, on what you think it says. I think it's highly probable it's an abscess. He said, yeah, yeah, it's either that or it's like, it's got a multifocal uh, cancer. But um, so anyways, going back, the, the, like this, this is in real time. At five o'clock, I remember his, his, his spouse ran in and said, oh, I have all these papers from BC and they probably have stuff on here that's relevant. And, and sure enough, it, it definitely was relevant because the patient had a lap coli uh, months earlier um, for query hepatic abscess. And basically, this is probably a recurrence. Um, so I didn't know this beforehand. Um, also notably, the patient was admitted for unusual behavior. So I feel like that's clinically relevant, that he's probably had an abscess now for, you know, more than a week. And so this whole idea of triaging behavior describes the action of what a practitioner does when they find an unsuspecting finding that they're not looking for or not trained to evaluate. And that's where you need a systematic and organized approach to the findings. But this is where under training and overconfidence are most likely to lead practitioners astray. Okay, so, you know, I do think that um, you need to have a certain level of training to actually um, start uh, acknowledging these findings and knowing what to do with them. So there is always a risk that someone will miss a finding, um, especially if they're under trained, or will perhaps, you know, have the whole kind of cart, uh, the horse lead the cart phenomenon with under training as well. Just for people wondering, like, could this be hemangioma? Well, you can see that there is uh, quite a bit of difference. The image left was a patient. Image right is uh, hemangioma. Another example of triaging behaviors. So this person was asked to perform point of view ultrasound on an ICU patient for query pleural effusion. The resident says, I think there's a pleural effusion there, but I'm not sure. And I'll tell you, it's just a gigantic heart. So it's not a pleural effusion. So phone a friend, no need to be bold. Consider your treasure behaviors in your response and always revert re 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 back to the original question or whether or not you have kind of a dual diagnosis phenomenon or it's completely incidental and unrelated to the presentation. This is, uh, I made this up by calling together a bunch of Latin words, but this patient uh, had a cardiac arrest on a nephrology ward, uh, transplant patient without kidney failure who was hyperkalemic and uh, got a bunch of CAGs late on the weekend, arrested on a Monday morning, and uh, I'm doing the echo during the arrest. And I think to myself, what is that? Um, so this is, I will again highlight, this was definitely during the arrest. And so I feel probably most likely the story, this guy had recurrent episodes of acute kidney injury, acute kidney injury dehydration with no liver enzymes, quite likely just, you know, had progressive metastatic cancer that was unrecognized. Were you really up in his actual? Uh, no, no. You know what? I think I was there initially. Um, you know, it's just a harried situation because obviously, you know, we're talking to the family saying uh, this guy's probably got cancer. Unfortunately, that wasn't maybe recognized. Because all the cystic kidney problems are cancer, some sort of infiltrative. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the summary. So when encountering an unexpected finding, go back to the original question. And be careful of falling into the trap of ultrasound findings, guiding a diagnosis, especially when learning a new technique or the diagnosis is ambiguous. We talked about triaging behaviors and reflect on how you deal with such findings and never be afraid to seek additional expertise in imaging or consultation. The other thing I liked about your case is- That's all I have, yeah. And it was brought up uh, with Jessica's case as well as uh, Tom's case, is that it's really important if you see an abnormal finding, one image is not good enough. You guys like did further digging, you did further squeeze, you kept looking, and then you also got you know ex expertise or further imaging to like qualify what you found. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, for sure. Good. Excellent. Any other comments or questions? <laughs> you can find one, just bump it up to another study. Yeah, I mean. So there was a study that was done of emergency physicians looking at incidental findings where they actually reviewed 200 cases um, by a radiologist or a couple of radiologists. And they said that basically, um, you know, 20, 25% rate of incidental findings and 50%, uh, I think in 50% of cases where they found um, what appeared to be concern, like um, uh, concerning findings, 
than fault imaging actually addressing those findings. Uh, and actually, the, there's fairly moderate agreement with, with radiologists on those findings. It was actually pretty good for the most part. The interesting thing is that in, in both emergency and critical care, we're fairly used to dealing with ambiguity and kind of not knowing the history or, or not knowing anything about the patient. And unfortunately, things will always get by. And I hate to say that, but things will always get by your radar because it just takes time. And that's where in critical care, we have, I think, arguably we have more benefit because we have time. And we have time to review the images. We have time to go through the story. Whereas uh, I think in emergency medicine, it's very much like, you know, you're given your dinner and said eat. Um, no, I would say that, um, no. So 25%, uh, just incidental in general. So it's, it's you know, Obviously, it's a proportion of, of those 25%. But it's just, you know, again, it comes back to that problem where, you know, I call them incidental, but technically they're kind of quasi incidental. It's just that you didn't think about it as a diagnosis. And it happens on CT imaging as well for us all the time. It happens in medicine in general. It's just an ultrasound, you're kind of right there. You're right in the trenches. So it, it just makes it a bit more challenging at times to figure out whether or not, you know, the diagnosis fits with the pretest, or actually it just wasn't considered, or if it's just completely it's incidental. Okay, well, I'll cut it off there. Thanks a lot, Dr. Wang. Fantastic job presenting. That was a great case. Uh, I'd like to say thanks as well to Dr. Jellick. He had to leave, but uh, I think everything lined up there superbly. Okay, thanks everybody.